an unsolved mysteries. September 7th, 1996. Gunfire erupts along the famous Las Vegas Strip, taking the life of rap music star Tupac Shakur. Today, disturbing questions haunt the investigation. Why were Shakur's trusted bodyguards unarmed? Why did the killer seem to target only Shakur? And why was almost no one willing to talk? They are snapshots of a different time and place. Virginia Burns always thought she was the baby in the pictures. Then Virginia learned about her father's secret life. And now she needs your help to find her long lost sister. It is a phenomenon so bizarre that it defies belief. Ordinary people suddenly and inexplicably bursting into flame. Mainstream science says it can't happen, but independent researchers insist that the evidence doesn't lie. Spontaneous human combustion is real. In Ohio, the quiet calm of a small community is shattered when Becky Wood and her grandchildren are terrorized by a pair of vicious armed robbers. Now the intruders have been unmasked and authorities need your help to track them down. Join me for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Becky Wood doesn't need this police photograph to remember the terror, the choking fear of being bound, assaulted, and absolutely convinced that she and her four grandchildren were going to die. It happened in February of 1996, when two men, disguised in masks, invaded her home. It was 7 a.m. Becky's husband had just left for work. The intruders seemed to know exactly what they were looking for. Open the safe! Open the safe! When I first opened my eyes, I saw a man with blood on the head and the eye. And I thought, oh my God, I'm having this bad dream. And then when he said it again, I knew it was for real. Let's go! Come on, come on. Becky's granddaughter was sleeping beside her, and Becky thought to hide her with a blanket. Kitchen. Three other children were asleep in different bedrooms. Move, move, into the kitchen, into the kitchen. I never felt so helpless. Take it out, okay? Take it off! I was afraid for my grandchildren, and I kept praying to God, you know, please let the children sleep through this. Don't let them wake. The whole time he's screaming, where's the combination? Where's the combination? Now the kitchen! Tell me to call the rest of the safe. And I tried to explain to them that I didn't know what I didn't have it with me. Could I please call my daughter? He kicked me in the head and he kept telling me that they would take the children. I'd never see them again. And I kept trying, I swear I don't have the combination. I swear I would open that, I give it to you. I don't have it. Sounds of ransacking came from upstairs where the second intruder was looting Becky's dresser of jewelry. That's when nine-year-old Matthew wandered out of his room. Here we go, one up! I don't really know how to explain what I felt. Like my heart just felt like it was just gonna beep or something. It was pounding real hard and all that because I didn't know what it was. He threw Matthew on the floor and put his hands behind him and tied him up. I saw the man's feet coming around in front of me. 
and he took a trash bag and put it over my grandson's head. I thought they were gonna take me out in this rug and kill me, and they were gonna smother Matthew. Don't say anything! You count to 2,000 before you move or else we'll be back to kill you. <laughs> Becky Wood heard the safe drag across the floor. She heard her car starting, then silence as it was driven away. One of the other children awoke and cut Becky and Matthew free. Becky then discovered that the intruders had sliced all the alarm and phone lines. Neighbors summoned police. In addition to stealing Becky's car, the robbers had made off with $20,000 worth of jewelry and the locked safe containing the Woods' life savings, another $18,000 in cash. Well, why they stole a lot of our possessions that I'll never be able to replace. I'm thankful we're alive. That afternoon, police found Becky's 91 Lincoln at a nearby car wash. The safe turned up a week later, emptied of cash, but yielding evidence that could help convict the robbers once they were identified. As police began to review the case, the facts pointed to one conclusion. The assailants had known exactly where to find the wires for the home alarm system. They knew just where the safe was kept. They knew just where to look for Becky's jewelry. They had known too much to be total strangers. I'd met back up again with Becky and, and her husband, Woody. We asked them to do something that was kind of difficult for them. Uh, we asked them to sit down and start thinking about people they knew and uh, people that they've dealt with and people that have worked for them and put a list together for us. It would prove to be a solid hunch. When the jewelry showed up at pawn shops in Pittsburgh, 100 miles away, police there believed it had been sold by a man named Larry Juster. State computers yielded this photograph. The information was relayed to Ohio. Becky and her husband had left town to recover some peace of mind after the robbery. Their daughter offered to review the pawn shop leads for local police. Listen, there's a photograph I need you to take a look at. You wouldn't happen to recognize this guy, would you? Yeah, it's Gary Noble. It's Gary Noble? Gary Noble. It's not Larry Juster? Mm, that's what the name says, but that's Gary Noble. And his brother, Ted Noble, worked for my dad a couple months ago. Ted Noble had briefly worked for the Wood family eight months prior to the robbery. When Ted and his brother, Gary, found that detectives were closing in, they fled Ohio and are still on the run. We were given information that uh, they had made statements that they had no intention of being taken alive if confronted by law enforcement. Uh, the way we entered our warrants is with extreme caution on the two of them. The robbery has done something to us that you don't really understand unless you go through it yourself. And I'm angry what they did to my grandchildren. And I'm angry. I am angry at the man that did this. Coming up, he was one of rap music's most popular and controversial stars. Then he was gunned down by an unknown assailant who killed Tupac Shakur. But first, Virginia Burns always thought she was an only child. Then she learned that her father had gone to his grave with the secret of an ill-fated romance and a long-lost daughter. And the heartwarming reunion of a young man and the anonymous Good Samaritan who saved his life. August 27, 1995, began as a joyous day for Steve and Sharon Newton of Immokalee, Florida. That morning, their first child, Virginia, was born. Steve had come to the hospital straight from work. At around 2 p.m., he headed home on his motorcycle to pick up the family car. He had no way of knowing he was
was on a collision course with disaster. I just remember coming straight down on my head. As I hit, I saw, poof, this big bright light, and that was it. Then I was just completely out. For Steve Newton, death was just a heartbeat away. Then, a gift from heaven. Are you OK? Can you hear me? A passing motorist had turned Steve over in the water and saved him from drowning. She remained at the scene until Steve was transported to a hospital. Then she disappeared, and Steve never learned her name. If she could just see my daughter, she'll know that she did me the, the greatest favor or gift that anybody can give, and that's to give me back my life. And I'd like to say thank you for that. With the help of our viewers, Steve Newton recently had a chance to do just that. Here's Keely Shea Smith with the details. Bob, a woman in Florida recognized the story as one she had heard from a co-worker named Tammy Dodson. After the broadcast, Tammy's boyfriend discussed the case with one of his co-workers, who happened to be Steve Newton's father-in-law. It soon became perfectly clear that Steve's mysterious Good Samaritan was, in fact, Tammy Dodson. On January 31st, 1997, Steve and Tammy met face to face for the first time since the near fatal accident. As a special treat, Steve brought along Virginia, now one and a half years old. Nobody's ever gone that far to come to thank me. And he kept saying that I was his angel. I've never been called an angel before, far from it. But um, it just, I mean, it made me feel good inside to know that I've done, I've done something that's helped somebody so much. <laughs> Steve and his wife, Sharon, now expecting their second child, were finally able to express their gratitude to the woman who had saved Steve's life. I owe her everything. And um, there's nothing that I have I can give to her, you know, to just say thank you. Right through here, it started. Before the day was out, Tammy and Steve returned to the scene of the accident, all too aware that Tammy's simple act of kindness had changed both of them forever. It makes me want to do more for other people. Now, I, you know, I, if someone's in trouble, I would go that extra mile, you know, to, to that extra, just to help that person. I just wanted to hug him. I was so glad to see that he was okay, and the baby and everything. I was just, just thrilled that he was fine. The images are from another place and another time. A proud young father cradles his newborn daughter. Her gentle smile captured in dozens of photographs. Virginia Burns of Aurora, Colorado, always thought they were pictures of her. She learned the truth when she was in her early 30s. My father said, oh no, those aren't you. And I asked my mother, well, who are they? And she says, oh, that's just a friend's baby. Mom, how are you feeling? Years would pass before Virginia finally learned Why the entire truth. In 1991, a year after Virginia's father died, her mother confided that he had been previously married. Then she made an even more startling revelation. Honey, there's something I have to tell you. You have a sister. What do you mean, I, I have a sister? You know the baby pictures that you always thought were you and we told you they were the daughter of a friend of ours? But she's your sister. My mother admitted that she didn't tell me to protect me. She had no way of knowing where my sister was and why tell me if there was no way I could meet her. Three months later, Virginia's mother also passed away. With both of her parents gone, 
Virginia launched a search for the sister she had never known. I was looking through the pictures, and I, I found written on the back of one, in my father's handwriting, it said, Susan and I and Hugo. And I had no idea where Hugo was, so I asked my husband, and he said, well, that's a little town out on the eastern plains of Colorado. Hugo, Colorado is where Virginia's father, Joe Corum, lived in 1942. He was a dishwasher and busboy in a small cafe. That's where Joe met a young woman named Diana. Hey, I just wanted to know if maybe Friday night you'd want to go to the picture show with me. Oh, I'd love to, but I don't think my mother will let me go. Okay. Well, how about a walk? Just for an hour. Diana's mother, Clara, ran the cafe. Diana, come here. I don't like you talking to that boy. Mother, he's a perfectly nice person. He could be a nice person, but honey, he's a drifter. He just came in here. Clara one day. didn't approve of my father because he was poor and he had no future. He, she didn't see where he could really, you know, go anywhere. Despite Clara's objections, a romance blossomed. Joe and Diana decided to get married. A year later, Susan was born. But the tensions between Joe and his mother-in-law apparently escalated and eventually drove Joe and Diana apart. In 1946, they divorced, and Joe left town for good. Come here, sweetie. That's my little girl. Daddy's gonna miss you. Diana. I need you inside. I think it was probably one of the sure most this? heartbreaking things he ever went through. I'm sorry, Joe. To leave Susan and Diana. I, I really don't think he would have left unless there was just horrendous pressure on him. Joe Coram apparently never saw his wife or his daughter again. After the separation, he moved to Greeley, Colorado, where he fell in love with Virginia's mother, Dolly. They eloped, and Virginia was born a year later. Joe was happy with his new family, but he apparently never forgot the daughter he had left behind. Now looking back some 40 years, Virginia understands the poignance of one memorable incident from her childhood. It was Virginia's sixth birthday, for months, she had coveted a doll in the window of a local store. She was just like an unreachable dream. I opened that box, and there was that doll. And it was just like time stopped. I was so excited to get that doll. So what are you thinking of your doll, sweetie? I love her. She's beautiful. Well, what's her name? I don't know. What do you think I should call her? He says, why don't you call her Sweet Sue? How about Sweet Sue? And I did, not realizing that that was the name of my sister. Jenny, why don't you go inside and play with your dolly? OK. Run in inside. Sweet Sue? I know, I know. It's OK. You must really miss her. Yeah. Let's clean up. OK. I know I missed her. A lot of times when I was growing up, he would search faces. We would go out and there'd be a lot of little girls around, you know, and he would search faces. Virginia learned that her father tried to find Diana and Susan several times, but it was never successful. He died in 1990 without ever learning their fate. Virginia now hopes to succeed where her father failed and find the sister whose memory lingers on in the sweet innocence of a young girl's doll. This is important to me for two reasons. Number one, here is a little girl who has gone her whole life without knowing that she had a father who cared about her. My sister does not know that her father cared about her, that he looked for her, that he wanted to find her. She needs to know she has a father who loved her. And secondly, I have a sister out there, 
and I'm more than ready to be a sister. When we return, for mainstream science, it is too incredible to believe, but some researchers are convinced that spontaneous human combustion is very, very real. And later, last September, dozens of eyewitnesses watched in horror as rap music star Tupac Shakur was gunned down on the crowded Las Vegas Strip. Six months later, the killer remains at large. coffee at Kay and Mike Fletcher's hardly ranked as an unsolved mystery until the peculiar events of February 11th, 1996. It happened just after 9 a.m. Mike? Kay. The Fletchers say that smoke suddenly began to billow from Kay's body. It, it's not my sweater. Take it off. I had Michael take a look at my back. I said, take a look at my back, because I'm thinking, do I have blisters or what? And he says, no, it's just red. We really were frantically looking through the clothing, you know, like arm and back, and just looking it over very carefully. And we found absolutely no discoloration. We found no sight of any kind of fire damage. Yeah, I mean, it was actually coming off of her skin, but there was no flame. The smoke was so thick that we did have to turn on the fan and open the window just to get the smoke out of there. Now, earlier in my life, I had worked at a crematory, and it, the smell was that of burnt flesh. I, there was no mistake of that, because I, you know, it's, it's an unmistakable smell. Mike? Mike? For Kay and Mike Fletcher, it was frighteningly real, yet at the same time almost impossible to believe. Only later did they learn that such mysterious episodes have been reported for well over 500 years. Students of the paranormal call it spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, when a perfectly normal person bursts into flame without warning and without apparent cause. Mainstream scientists dismiss such accounts. Still, the reports have persisted since the 15th century show no signs of letting up now at the dawn of the 21st. If there is indeed such a thing as SHC, Kay Fletcher is one of the few who lived to tell about it. Most of the others weren't so lucky. March 26, 1986, Kendall Mott was worried. His father, George, a retired fireman, had serious lung problems. An air pump and face mask helped keep him breathing. But on that day, George hadn't answered repeated phone calls. A quick look around convinced Kendall that something was wrong. The windows were all brown. And I noticed that the door handle was warm when I grabbed it. Yeah. It was real dark inside the house, and it smelled like it had been burnt. Dad? Dad? Kendall was confronted by a ghastly sight fire had reduced his father to a scattering of ashes, a few splinters of bone, and a fragment of skull. It's scary to find somebody like that, to walk in and find somebody that you love, you know, all burnt like that, with no explanation as to why or what happened. The case of George Mott in the spring of 1986 has all the hallmarks of classic spontaneous human combustion. There is incredible localized damage done to the body. Uh, George Mott was incinerated to an extent that we have been told by forensic experts could only be replicated inside a crematorium operating at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit or more for 12 long hours. The searing heat had melted a television in the room, yet curiously, it had left much of the bedding unscathed. In addition, scarcely two feet away, a box of wooden matches had failed to ignite, and air was still pumping through George's face mask. 
Skeptics, however, insist that behind the bizarre scene lies a rational explanation. Now, do I know exactly what happened? I don't, but let me reconstruct a little bit. We're told that Mr. Mott was a former uh, drinker and a former smoker, but that he had reformed. He was supposed to be depressed. Just suppose that he said, what the heck, I think I'll have a cigarette. This would explain him taking off the oxygen mask while the unit would still be left running. And it would explain why the matches were there. Now, if that's the case, then this is just another case of smoking in bed and is not mysterious and is a rather mundane case. But not even skeptics use the word mundane to describe what Don Gosnell found in December of 1966. A gas company meter man in Countersport, Pennsylvania, Gosnell called on Irving Bentley, a 92-year-old retired physician. That day, Dr. Bentley was apparently away from home. Gosnell let himself into the basement. When I got to the bottom of the steps, there was a pile of ashes on the floor. And there was an, an odor, uh, something I'd never encountered before. It was kind of a sickening sweet odor. And then I looked up, and here there was a hole burnt through the floor right above me. And I stood there and I looked at that hole, and there was little red embers all around the hole yet. And all I could think was, they got Dr. Bentley out of here, but why didn't somebody call the fire company and get this taken care of? So I went running upstairs and, and went in to the bathroom, and that's when I found the remains of Dr. Bentley or what was left. All there was was part of one leg and was so discolored, I couldn't tell it was a human being or a mannequin until I got right down close and looked at it. And when I got the picture, I left right then. What is so amazing and so profoundly perplexing to mainstream science about the scene that Dr. Bentley left behind is the incredibly intense fire that consumed his body quite literally to powder, leaving behind only his head, a knee bone, and a lower left leg as mute testimony that this had once been a human being. The rest of his body was ash in the basement below. We believe that Dr. Bentley answered a call of nature, to be polite, or standing in front of the toilet, suddenly, spontaneously, he became a human fireball. The nature of the fire, and we kind of use fire in quotes here, failed to produce enough thermal energy to melt the aluminum walker, failed to produce enough heat to blister paint on the bathtub inches away and yet was quite capable of directing its energy downward through the oak beams, through the flooring, and into the subfloor beneath, into the basement. The case of someone like Dr. Bentley is very understandable in the sense of him being infirm. He had a history uh, of setting his clothes on fire from his pipe. His uh, clothing was pockmarked with burns from his pipe. Dr. Bentley also had a habit of keeping matches in his bathrobe pockets. Joe Nickel believes that burning ashes from Bentley's pipe dropped near them and they ignited, and there was plenty of fuel to feed the flames. In many of the cases, the person's own body fat can contribute to the fire. If we imagine Dr. Bentley with his body on fire, he falls to the floor. There is linoleum on that floor, and linoleum, once it catches fire, is a very powerful uh, flammable material. The flooring burned, the subflooring burned, and beams, there's beams underneath. There's a tremendous amount of wood underneath his body to act as a funeral pyre. Mysterious? Not really, not scientifically mysterious. Unusual, yes. The debunkers of spontaneous human combustion could conduct a very simple experiment. Take a cadaver, put it on a tar-based linoleum flooring, put an aluminum walker over top of it, and drop a cigarette on it. If it burns to powder, we're going to be real impressed, and that person deserves a Nobel Prize in physics. But I'll wager money that experiment's going to fail. Larry Arnold theorizes that some cases of spontaneous human combustion may be an explosive aberration of the electrical current flows naturally present in the body. We have the potential of hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity coursing through the body instantaneously. If the amperage is sufficiently high, then the body would literally become its own electrocution mechanism. 
it would fry itself out from the inside electrically. Uh, this is uh, crack pottery of a very high order. There is not a single reasonable theory for spontaneous human combustion. There is no convincing scientific evidence of it. And so the mystery mongers ought to shut up and get a life. Larry Arnold is unfazed by such criticism. He claims to have researched over 400 cases of spontaneous human combustion, some dating back to the 1400s, and many documented by photographs. The naysayers, the PhDs who are phenomena-hating debunkers, choose not to face the facts. This is a mystery that's crying out for study, that's crying out for recognition. This is a mystery that is, to this day, unsolved. Next, the poetic music of rap star Tupac Shakur glorified gang culture and seemed to predict his own violent demise. Now the investigation into Shakur's murder has become a tangle of chilling speculation and conflicting theories. Tupac Shakur, one of rap music's most popular and enigmatic artists. His autobiographical songs reflected a dark, treacherous world he knew all too well. Alternately described as a street thug and a charismatic poet, Tupac won the adoration of millions. By the age of 25, he had cut four platinum albums and starred in five feature films. I thought he was a brilliant man. Thought he had a lot of vision, a lot of foresight. Uh, he made, uh, he was very creative, he was an artist, you know, and at the same time, he was a revolutionist. He was a great person, he was extremely charismatic, he was very intelligent, very business smart, um, very funny, very warm, intelligent, caring. Um, that was the Tupac that I knew. Despite his success, Tupac could never resist the lure of the streets. Between 1991 and 1995, he was arrested eight times, in 1994, he was shot five times and left for dead in the lobby of a New York City recording studio. In 1995, he served eight months in prison for rape. Within a year of his release, Tupac's explosive past finally caught up with him. He was cut down in a hail of gunfire just off the Las Vegas Strip. His killer is still unidentified, still at large. According to those who knew him best, Tupac Shakur never expected to reach his 25th birthday. He was wrong, but only by three months. Shakur's untimely death has raised a host of questions and given rise to three distinct theories about his murder. A murder that occurred as Tupac Shakur relaxed with friends in America's playground, Las Vegas, Nevada. It was September 7th, 1996. Las Vegas was operating at full capacity. Thousands had gathered for the heavyweight boxing match between Mike Tyson and Bruce Seldon, held at the world-famous MGM Grand Hotel. Tupac Shakur was one of the many celebrities who attended the fight. He was accompanied by Marion Shug Knight, CEO of Death Row Records, Shakur's recording company. This photograph of Tupac and Shug was taken after the fight at around 10.55 p.m. They were headed for Suge's dance club, followed by an entourage of musicians and bodyguards. Tupac, who normally was known to pack a weapon, as was Suge and, and many people in the entourage, they weren't armed that night, and, and everybody said they felt safe. Reporter Kathy Scott is writing a book about the murder. So it was a very festive mood. They were. Obviously, they were playing, playing their music loud, so they were in a party and mood. They were flirting with women. At 11.10, Tupac and Shug pulled up to an intersection and spoke with two unidentified women. Party somewhere? No, Dad, always a party. Hang oh. The two were looking at the girls and talking to them. That's what the witnesses have told police. And that's when a white Cadillac drove up on the passenger side next to Tupac. 
and open fire. Tupac tried to climb into the back seat and didn't make it. As the attackers sped away, Suge Knight took off in the opposite direction. He finally stopped in front of a casino one mile away. Tupac Shakur was in critical condition, shot in the chest, in the hip, and in the hand. Suge Knight had escaped with a slight bullet graze in the temple. Despite the presence of thousands of potential witnesses, police say only one person offered a glimmer of hope. Oh, the car behind him. The car behind him? Ya Fufula, one of Tupac's backup singers, was riding in the car directly behind Suge and Tupac. He told police that night that he could do a photo lineup, pick out the gunman from a photo lineup. Um, police interviewed him briefly, uh, apparently not extensively, took his number, and he went on his way. For six long days, fans gathered outside the Las Vegas hospital where Tupac clung to life. It was a losing battle. On the afternoon of September 13, 1996, Tupac Shakur took his last breath and died. Initially, conventional wisdom had it that Tupac fell victim to a spontaneous burst of gang violence. Supporting that scenario was this videotape, recorded by a security camera at the MGM Grand just three hours before the shooting. Members of Tupac's entourage can be seen in the lobby engaged in a brutal scuffle. Both Suge Knight and Tupac were present. Moments later, Tupac, followed by Suge, can be seen hurrying through the casino. The target of the assault was 22-year-old Orlando Anderson, an alleged member of a Los Angeles street gang, the Southside Crips. It has long been rumored that Suge Knight is affiliated with a rival gang, the Compton Bloods. Was this confrontation the spark that led to Tupac's murder? Any time someone as popular as Tupac Shakur can be killed in front of thousands of people after one of the biggest events in the world and one of the most popular cities of Las Vegas, uh, in the world, then it is, it's something more to it than just some random shooting by some idiot who decided to pick up a gun and point at Tupac Shakur. It has to be uh, some organization or some movement behind that killing. Some say this music video by Tupac offers a clue to a second scenario. In the months preceding his death, Tupac was at the center of a heated dispute between East Coast and West Coast rap music factions. There was a rivalry that started between Tupac Shakur and um, artist Biggie Smalls and Puffy Combs, who is the CEO of Bad Boy Entertainment. Um, that rivalry between them existed because when Tupac was shot at Quad Studios, he felt not that Biggie and Puffy set him up, but that they knew that it was coming and didn't warn him. Pop, you alive? I mean, you safe? Man, In a dramatized right? portion of the video, Tupac publicly blamed Puffy Combs and Biggie Smalls for the attack that nearly killed him in 1994. It was Buff's idea. Oh, man, I'm just a rapper, man. No one has ever been arrested in that shooting. I ain't gonna kill you. We was homeboys once, Pig. Once we homeboys, we always homeboys. Just weeks before his death, Tupac appeared on radio station KMEL in San Francisco and candidly discussed his feelings towards his East Coast rivals. While I'm in jail, strangers is telling me, yo, you don't know? Biggie homeboy shot you. Because they bragging, they telling they n****s in jail. Yo, we just got pot, woo, 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 woo. And that's why what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. I'm destroying them. I'm destroying them. Just last weekend, Biggie Smalls, AKA Notorious B.I.G., was himself gunned down shortly after leaving a party in Los Angeles. At this time, there is no known connection between his murder and Shakur's. In addition, there is no proof that the East Coast-West Coast rivalry had anything to do with Tupac's death. 
leading to intense speculation about a third possibility. Perhaps the murder was an inside job orchestrated by someone close to Tupac Shakur. This scenario is populated by unanswered questions. In the midst of the jam-packed Vegas Strip, how did the gunman know where Tupac would be? Why did he seem to target only Tupac? Why weren't Tupac's bodyguards armed at the time of the shooting when they had been armed earlier in the evening? We had a black beamers in front, Chef's driving. And why were the strips swarming with people, including the two unidentified women just a few feet from the shooting, was no one apparently willing to cooperate with police? What I was told by one homicide detective was that everybody went deaf, dumb, and blind. They were surprised because they said, these are professional bodyguards. They're paid to guard, you know, Tupac. He hired them for this purpose, yet they didn't see anything. I mean, I don't know. I know if he was... The only person who reportedly did see something, Yafu Fula, never had the opportunity to view a photo lineup of possible suspects. Within a week of the shooting, he returned to his home in New Jersey. Two months later, Fula was gunned down in the stairwell of a housing project. A random act of violence or a premeditated murder to keep Fula from talking to the authorities. He was their best bet. He was right behind the car when it happened, and he said he could identify. He believed he could identify the gunman. And now Fula's dead, and they don't have that anymore. Authorities have always maintained that Fula was the only eyewitness willing to talk. However, just two weeks ago, two other members of Tupac's entourage claimed they told police from the beginning that they had a clear view of the shooter. They say police never asked them to view a photo lineup. The police say the men initially denied seeing the shooter, but have now re-interviewed them. Ironically, in one of Tupac's final videos, he seemed to foretell his own violent demise. Cut down in a hail of gunfire by a shadowy, unknown assassin. I don't know if we'll ever know who killed Tupac Shakur, but I do know that there's millions of people that are devastated by his loss. There was a lot of things people might consider bad about Tupac, but there, were, there was a lot of good things about Tupac, and we had yet to see all the good things that uh, I believe could have came out of Tupac Shakur. Join me next time for more Unsolved Mysteries.